Okay, so uh, in very briefly, because uh, in a way the, the arguments for and against are w what the whole day is to be about, but I'll in, in quite uh, cursory form run over some of the main arguments. And the first point to enter really is, is a caveat, a question mark, over ma what's maybe the whole premise behind this uh, discussion. It raises the question, will changing the electoral system really change anything about sh Irish politics? Um, and as it says there, sometimes the effect of changing an electoral system can be exaggerated. Those of you with very long memories who, who were around at the time of the, the two referendums we've had, 1959, 1968, might remember that the debate there was one that saw, for some people on each side, that saw almost the survival of democracy at stake. If the wrong decision was made, some people said democracy in Ireland could collapse. And the argument was that democracy in some other countries had collapsed because the wrong decision was made about the electoral system choice. Now, contemporary research sees that as being wildly exaggerated. The survival of democracy really was never at stake in this country or elsewhere in Western Europe since the war. The electoral system really does not make that much difference. Electoral systems do have an effect in certain regards. In particular, they might affect the degree of proportionality of an election result, the number of parties that, that win elections. So in New Zealand, for example, when they moved from first past the post to a, to a PR system, the number of parties in parliament increased. Uh, coalition government became the norm. They had more disproportional outcomes. But deeper features of a country's politics are unlikely to change. There have been a number of countries where, say, corruption has been a problem. Some people have blamed the electoral system. They change the electoral system. What happens to corruption levels? Absolutely nothing. They continue exactly the same level under the new electoral system. And that's because, uh, really, electoral systems do not explain as much about a country's politics as, uh, as some people used to think, and maybe some people still do think. So in the context of this country, uh, uh, five years ago, everyone would have said the country is doing fantastically economically, e e economy growing. Is PR and PRSTV in any way responsible for that? Most people would have said no, PRSTV really was not responsible for what economic boom we had, nor is it responsible for, for the slump. So we shouldn't exaggerate the effect of, of, of electoral systems in the first place. So with that big caveat in mind, I look at some of the, uh, some of the arguments that have been put forward for change, and of course in each case I'm giving really a very slimmed down version of the arguments in question, and proponents or opponents would, would, would say that, that, that there's much more to be said than that, and there is, so I'm just uh, summarizing some of the points. So to get this one out of the way, that this, this was the main argument, believe it or not, at the time of the two referendums in 1959 and 1968, uh, stability of government. The argument being that first past the post, the system used in Britain, usually gives single party majority government. PR usually gives uh, uh, coalition governments. And that was tied in with an argument to the effect that single party government is good, coalition government is bad. But without going into all the details of it, even, even as I say that, most of you will think well, that if, if that was ever an argument, it's pretty dated now. Hardly anyone uh, argues it uh, at all. Uh, in terms of government stability, by any measure, there's absolutely no sign of government instability in, 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 in this country by European standards. The time between elections, survival of government, really no different from the European norm. And the, the whole idea that single party governments might be innately better than or worse than coalition governments, you don't hear that anymore in political discourse or in academic discourse. There are good single party governments, bad single party governments, good coalition governments, bad coalition governments. So that argument, which was the big argument in, in the two referendums we've had on the electoral system, probably would hardly surface at all if there were to be another one. Second one, uh, the level of proportionality, that's to say how closely do party and indeed independent seat shares reflect their vote shares. Um, well, over the years, uh, levels of proportionality in this country have been pretty average by, by European PR standards. Um, but over recent elections, the last three elections, the level of proportionality has been going up. The last election we had was the most disproportional ever 
Fine Gael with 36% of the first preference votes won 46% of the seats on a purely proportional basis. It should have won 60 seats, actually won 76 seats. So elections are becoming rather dis disproportional. The reason for that is something that was mentioned this morning. It's not really PRSTV, in fact, it's nothing to do with PRSTV. Really, it's the small number of TDs elected from each constituency when the average number of TDs elected per constituency is as low as four as it is in this country, it's hardly surprising we'll get uh, quite, quite significant divergences between vote shares and seat shares. In some other countries, the, the average number would be a lot larger. In Finland, say, the average size is 13 MPs, Luxembourg 15, and, and, and so on. So if this is seen as a problem, the solution is pretty straightforward. It's to have larger constituencies with an average of five, six, seven, eight uh, uh, TDs from each, uh, as I was mentioning this morning. There's no constitutional barrier to that. Um, the main uh, criticism made of the electoral system these days tends to, to be this one, the focus of TDs. Um, as we know, PR STV involves each candidate competing against every other candidate. Candidates are competing not only against people from other parties, but also candidates of their, of their own party. And the question is raised, does this distort the, the, the focus of uh, TDs? Does it compel them to focus on, uh, on constituency minutiae, which is sometimes maybe uh, unfairly and derisively dismissed as uh, fixing potholes or ward healing or clientelism? Does it incentivize them? if they want to retain their seat, to focus on that kind of thing rather than, uh, rather than on important national issues. Well, as Michael Marsh was mentioning this morning, there are some people who, who argue that it does uh, have that effect. And if it does, maybe that has an impact on the quality of TDs in the first place. Maybe able young men and women <clears throat> take a look at what a political life would entail, what, what being a TD would entail, and say, well, that's not for me. I, might, I feel I've got a contribution to make to national politics and legislation and so on, but I don't want to spend all my time uh, doing constituency work. So critics of PRSTV raise those concerns, and uh, they're, 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 uh, they're ones that could be teased out more fully. Um, <clears throat> having said that, there is, a, there is a, another side to the argument. Um, <clears throat> constituency work itself, is it really a bad thing, or should it be seen as, as a merit of the, of the Irish political system? I'm sure that every um, TD and senator in, in, in the room at, at, at the, uh, for the round table discussions, if asked how, how, how valuable is their constituency work, they, they could give you examples ranging from the completely pointless, complete waste of time at one end of the spectrum to very important, genuinely worthwhile at the other end of the spectrum. TDs from research done and from just talking to TDs, TDs are, are confronted by time wasters and chancers who want them to get things that they're not entitled to. They're also confronted by people who either don't know what office to, to contact to get their entitlements or they've engaged with the system as fully as they could, and they still haven't been able to, to, to get through to, to, to where they should and to get their entitlements, and the TD has actually been able to guide them through it and, and uh, get their rights for them. So I'm just making the point that constituency work, although it's easy to dismiss it all as fixing potholes, in fact, that there, there is a, a positive aspect to it. Um, in addition, although one might sometimes pick up the impression that constituency work is more or less unique to this country that MPs everywhere must spend all their time doing important things like considering legislation. In fact, when we look around the world, we find that MPs in most countries do uh, constituency work. Uh, our, our, our two closest neighbours, Britain and France, in both countries, MPs are uh, known for spending a lot of time in their constituency and, and, and spending much of their working life doing constituency work. In Canada, for example, Constituency work looms so large in the life of MPs that Parliament actually takes a week off, uh, one week in every four, so that MPs can spend the time entirely in their constituencies. So for MPs in most countries, constituency work is not seen as a sort of um, irritating distraction from the real job. It's seen actually as being part of the real job. And in this country, of course, we know that there's no regional tier of government and local government is weak. So all the questions and so on that might go to regional MPs, local councillors in countries with those tiers of government, inevitably they end up with the national 
parliamentarians here and the other countries I mentioned, Britain, France, Canada, they, they all have single member constituencies. There's no competition between candidates of the same party. So it does raise the question, would constituency work, would the demand for constituency work really disappear or significantly reduce under a different electoral system? Well, we'll never know until it's tried, but as I said before, if, if patterns are deeply embedded in attitudes and behavior, then uh, electoral system change alone would not, uh, would not change that. This is tied in with the idea of the accountability of TDs. Is accountability a good thing? Well. Uh, some people might say yes and no, PRSTV does make TDs very accountable as individuals. The electorate can vote out specific individuals, and if you're a supporter of a large party, you can vote out an individual TD without abandoning your party because you simply switch your first preference to another candidate of the same party. Now, accountability is generally seen as a good thing, but uh, some critics of PRSTV say, well, maybe you can have too much accountability, maybe... TDs are kind of hyper-accountable, uh, uh, hyper and they might actually do a better job as national parliamentarians if they were not, not so permanently accountable individually to, to the uh, uh, electorate. Uh, in a way that would be taking a, taking a leap into the unknown if we make them less accountable. Do they work harder as national parliamentarians or do they lose the incentive to be so responsive to us as individual TDs? Well, again, uh, we simply won't know it until and unless the electoral system is changed. When it comes to competition within parties, we do need to bear in mind that that's really innate in parties. As long as there are more people in a party who want to be a TD than, there are, than the party has seats, there's always going to be that competition. And if it doesn't appear at the electoral system stage, at the, the electoral stage, then it's going to manifest itself even more at some other stage, uh, particularly in this case at candidate selection stage. So in, in, a, in a country with, say, safe seats, David Farrell was mentioning this morning, Manchester Central, very safe Labour constituency, the, the battle there to become the Labour MP is decided by the Labour Party's candidate selectors and there could be very intense competition within the party to be picked as the Labour candidate because you know once you are picked as the Labour candidate there, you're bound to be a, a, a TD or uh, uh, the MP rather. So changing the electoral system doesn't actually get rid of competition within the party, it simply moves it to a different arena, one that the public might not see, uh, uh, see quite so much of. Um, if, if uh, and this is another criticism made or another question asked about PRSTV, if it's such a great system, people might say, how come so few countries use it? And as we, as we saw this morning, very few countries do use it. Only, uh, only two countries uh, use PRSTV to elect their national parliament, this country and Malta. Why isn't it used more widely around Europe, for example? Well. One reason is that not that many people are aware of it, but when they, when they do look at it, one concern people have is that because voters are not voting for a party, because they're voting for candidates, there's no guarantee that the share of a party's votes will match its share of the seats. We know from experience in this country, and very much so from Malta, that in practice that does happen. In practice, party shares of the votes do pretty closely match their shares of the seats, but there's no absolute guarantee of that. And that's something that makes some, some people in, in, in other EU countries a little bit wary of it. But there's a big caveat to that, which is that um, one of the aspects that, as I said before, critics of PR, STV, focus on in particular is this competition among candidates of the one party, the fact that Fine Gael candidates are competing against each other, Fianna Fáil candidates are, and in some cases Labour candidates are. That's, one of the, that's seen as one of the big criticisms by critics of PR, STV. But it's, it's often a surprise to people to, be, to learn that that is actually the norm in PR systems right across Europe, in the EU as a whole. In fact, there are 16 countries where voters have that facility, where voters, when they go to vote, they're given a choice of candidates within the one party. So that's true in, in 16 of the 27 EU countries, voters have a choice of candidates within the party. Candidates of one party are competing against each other. And you might say, well, which countries are they? Are they countries known for good governance, in which case maybe this is a good thing to get a slice of? Or are they countries known for bad governance, in which case it sounds like something to avoid? In practice, it tends to be countries with, with, with both kinds of records. So 
To give you a few examples, Denmark is one such country, Greece is another, Luxembourg, Latvia, Finland, Cyprus, Sweden. In all of those countries, voters have a choice of candidates within a party. Candidates of each party are competing with each other. And the list of countries I've mentioned, I won't, I won't be so undiplomatic as to, as to say which is which, but they include countries generally seen as among the best governance countries in Europe and maybe some that are among, among the worst. And then just a final point, just going back to alternatives. Um, <clears throat> it's hard in a way to have a meaningful debate, and I think this is perhaps the subject of the, of the next weekend. But one point that, that everyone who studies electoral systems really concurs on these days is that there is simply no one perfect electoral system. If there was, presumably every country would have uh, adopted it. So a meaningful debate, in a way, involves comparing different options, seeing what the pros and cons are of each, looking at the trade-offs, whereas looking at anyone in, uh, in isolation might, uh, might identify what, what are seen as shortcomings in that, but any alternative might have similar shortcomings or different but, but, but worse shortcomings or whatever. Well, that's the subject for a broader debate. So I've, I've simplified most of the arguments there, but I hope I've given you anyway a flavor of the points on both sides. So I'll finish there. Thank you.